I am uh, Adi Sumesfan. I'm an uh, orthopedic spine surgeon at the University of Rochester. I'm joined today by uh, Gene Taxmeister, who's an uh, interventional spine provider at uh, University of Southern California. Okay. And we uh, have been working together on a uh, addendum to the sign, mark, and x-ray campaign, or the SMACS campaign, uh, that was originally started in 2001 and led by uh, David Wong and colleagues with a, a revision in 2014. Uh, and we'll discuss us, the addendum we uh, uh, have been working uh, with the Patient Safety Committee under the leadership of uh, Dr. Maori and uh, Andy Walker. Uh, so, so Gene, um, maybe you can uh, give us a, uh, your overview of, of uh, some of the pertinent findings from the interventional sp spine standpoint that, sure. that we came across. Yeah, what we did was really take the literature from 2014 to until 2021 when we did literature search with the use of a research librarian, identified a little over 300 studies that were relevant, went through all those studies and identified the 53 most relevant that we thought would make an impact into making an addendum for the sign mark and x-ray document. Um, after those 53 articles were reviewed, we picked out some of the most relevant ones from there, including both from the interventional side and the surgical side in regards to some of the most impactful studies that I saw on my side from the international standpoint, um, it really was a paucity in the literature regarding the true incidence and the etiology of some of the errors that were made, uh, largely probably due to transitional segments and the like. In the surgical literature, a lot of the impactful studies have to do with education and some of the other methods uh, that have been developed over the last few years in terms of really identifying ways to prohibit uh, wrong side and wrong level surgery, optimize marking and things like that. If you wanna elaborate on some of the things that you've been working on, I know it's been a passionate project for you, both from a research educational side, you've had certain publications um, on this topic as well as some that we referenced here. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of the utility of some of the things that you've seen, how your practice have changed. And you know, obviously why do you think this is such an important topic, not only from practice, but being an educator as well? Yeah, so it's um, uh, de definitely a, a pertinent topic for all uh, spine providers, operative or, uh, and, and uh, interventional spine. Uh, from uh, you know, these 53 articles we, we identified over the past uh, eight to nine plus years, uh, we also worked with uh, uh, actually a research librarian uh, through the assistance of NAS to really compile all these articles. And uh, I, I believe the, the quality of the articles we found was, was uh, fantastic. And then we, we kind of did, did a deep dive to see, you know, which ones are gonna be more impactful to, for this addendum. Uh, so as, as a, you know, busy clinician and uh, educator, you know, it's, it's very important to uh, teach our next generation of uh, trainees on the importance of avoiding, uh, you know, wrong size surgery. Despite um, a lot of our efforts, uh, these have continued to happen. But what we found, especially in, in some of the large series, uh, one was from Cl the Cleveland Clinic where they have 21,000 plus patients. Uh, they did have several um, incidences of wrong side surgery and they implemented uh, several uh, uh, steps to prevent and has, this has really uh, plummeted their rates. Uh, some of it including having the same surgeon who's doing the exposure being, being present there for the spine marker uh, and training institutions and maybe uh, uh, not out of the ordinary for uh, a trainee to start it and the, the joint, the surgeon to join, but having that one person being there from that uh, critical part of the decision to marking it is, is important. Other part of it is also having another surgeon who's not uh, potentially uh, part of the case who may be available to also confirm the level with you. Uh, so th that's just one of the, the addendums uh, articles that we, we found useful. But one of my, uh, I think a lot of our passions is as education. You educate uh, residents and fellows and uh, really pr uh, letting them know and, and teaching them how do you, how do you uh, ch identify this transitional anatomy? How do you uh, pr prevent this? So one of the studies we, we uh, highlighted is also one where we surveyed North American spine surgery fellows and asked them how many of you have uh, witnessed wrong side surgery and about 33%, one out of three had, and more than two thirds were actually interested in some type of a curriculum uh, or some type of didactic to at least uh, learn more about this topic and how to prevent it. And that, that's uh, one topic we hope uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the NAS leadership that we can potentially uh, grow and, and expand on. Uh, but from the intervention spine standpoint, I think you, you identified um, a, a paper that predates um, the, the 2014, but it's still very applicable uh, to, you know, to, to the, the 
uh, to your to your uh, expertise. Uh, correct. I mean, the the large uh, problem with interventional is really nomenclature. What do you call a level? Is it lumbar eyes? Is it sacral eyes? Is it S1? Where do you count from? You know, focusing on a lumbar spine procedure, for example, you can't always count C2 down like you would with a C2, uh, with a CT guided. So uh, really being consistent with the radiologist, the orthopedic surgeon, the patient, um, and as far as in that procedure suite. Now we have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to spine surgeries that we do all of our interventions with image guidance and that is standard of care. So we always have an X-ray. We always have an image, whether it's CT or an X-ray, but identifying the correct level and correlating it to where the symptoms are is really the challenge in interventions and really making sure that the procedure is done at the pathologic level. Um, and in regards to radiology, at least from interventional side, when it's always there, um, what's the role of radiology confirmation or a second time out in terms of confirming a spine marker and fiduciary markers and things like that, which what we've seen liter uh, recently in the literature come up a little bit more prevalent is this fiduciary marker, this marking, this preoperative marking, secondary confirmation. Do you think that that is enough or are we not taking it further uh, enough with some of these uh, latest advances over the last few years in terms of it really identifying the level? Yeah, the, the thoracic spine is, is certainly um, a challenging area, especially with a single level or even a two level pathology. Uh, if one, it, it, it takes a fair amount of radiation to count from the sacrum up or from T1 down, but the use of fiducial markers, uh, which are you know, small metal markers that IR can place in a, the respective pedicle, uh, has definitely been um, published on since. Uh, um, 2014 extensively, and this has been incorporated into our addendum, where we're suggesting to consider using fiducial markers for uh, thoracic uh, uh, spine surgery uh, procedures. And these are, I've, I've used these in my practice. They, they don't take um, a, a lot of time to do, and they really do make it easier when, when we take a shot just to see exactly where we are. You take the ambiguity out of it. Um, and those markers, um, before you go on, are they done preoperatively by another clinician? Are they done uh, preoperatively by the surgeon? What would, in your experience, since you do use these traditional markers, what would be the advantage of both settings and how would you optimize that? Right, the, most of the literature seems to indicate uh, using interventional radiology to place some type of radio opaque marker. Uh, so uh, in, in my practice, I may have that patient do it preoperatively a week or two before surgery, ha have it in place, and then bring them in. Now, if they're uh, in, in, a, in a more of an emergent situation where they are coming through the emergency room, then we'll do it you know, while they're admitted. Um, the other um, you know, aspect of um, you know, what, what I have also, uh, we, have, we have found in our uh, literature search is really don't hesitate to have radiology. Uh, again, this is still part of the original SMACS campaign, but there's more and more uh, uh, literature supporting the, uh, go ahead and call, call radiology if, you, if there's an ambiguity, especially uh, with patients uh, that may have, uh, you know, body habitus or revision surgeries, or even if the, the x-ray that you're obtained intraoperatively is not ideal, uh, you know, calling radiology. And, um, and getting their thoughts on it, I think is also useful. Um, what do you think some of the future directions for research um, uh, and, uh, are in this topic? Uh, I think the true incidence, I think it's incredibly underreported, whether it's not in the literature, whether it's uh, self-reported, whether it's claims data, um, you can take a look at it. But uh, I feel that especially uh, at least looking at the literature in terms of the interventional side, that it is incredibly underreported. So we don't know how often this actually does occur with the true incidences. So it's hard to say what measures can be taken to avoid it or prevent it when we don't even know how common this truly is. Um, and it's anywhere from 30 to 50 percent when you look at polling of uh, trainees and things like that. So it could be as prevalent or as not. And then we really have to take the appropriate steps in order to ensure that it doesn't occur. So really, the basic epidemiological data is necessary. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I think that's, that's valuable information. That's where I think we can maybe leverage the, you know, the membership uh, of NAS for interventional spine, ortho spine neurosurgery standpoint to kind of learn uh, you know, what the true prevalence is. And there's papers that published that we found where they quote about 50%, but the response rate is still pretty low from the, exactly. from the group. Um, as far as, uh, you know, uh, to summarize, uh, you know, our findings, uh, mm -hmm. the, the take home points are uh, consider fiducial markers for um, thoracic spine procedures. Uh, do, do not hesitate to have radiology confirm uh, your level if, if there's any ambiguity. 
Uh, again, as, as the, the one study I quoted from uh, the Cleveland Clinic, you know, just if you're going to do the surgery, be there from the beginning to the point of the, at least the marking, so that way there's no uh, there's no uh, uh, discrepancy there. And then the the need to uh, consider having some type of educational curriculum for spine surgeons, interventional spine providers, as far as for fellows and, and trainees especially, mm -hmm. and how to prevent these. Um, as far as um, you know. From, from our work, I think we've really gotten a lot of support from the, uh, our committee chairs, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mari and Dr. Walker, but also the, the uh, membership of, the, of, the, of that committee. They've, they've vetted and have reviewed uh, this addendum, so we look forward to working with NAS to, uh, uh, to see where, the, where this goes. Yeah. Any comments from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think the addendum is in place. We're going on the, the final revisions. Obviously, it has to be approved by the board governors and the sections. And some of the other organizations that were involved in the original draft of the document um, and really want to have a complete uh, inclusion of everybody that was involved to make sure the progression is appropriate and addresses what each society and the multitude of societies that are involved really want to come across uh, as saying in a, uni uh, in a unified manner in order to make sure that this is addressed appropriately from the ground up educational level to practice and physicians.